From the fact that one in the same office is described with shepherds and teachers, one learns not only the purpose of the office, to lead congregations to eternal life, as shepherds lead their flocks to green pasture, but also the main means that God gives the shepherds for this purpose, namely the divine word. It comes out of the mouth of faithful shepherds as sacred teaching and must save the hearts of their congregations. In fact, the pastor has no other means to fulfill his office than the divine word. This is A Word Fitly Spoken. I'm your host, Zelwyn Heidi, here today with the Reverend David Apple to continue our series on Wilhelm Lay as the pastor and talking about preaching and being apt to teach. Uh, Willie is not able to be with us today because he's been called away, but it should be a good time. David, how are you doing? Doing well. It's uh, it's good to be on with just you. Willie really, you know, he's a lead weight. <laughs> <laughs> We're just throwing him under the bus yeah, while he's away. Yeah. Yep, I like it. I like it. How are things out in Kentucky? Things in Kentucky are well. Sunny, hot, humid, the usual summer. I mean, it's July, end of July here when we're recording. So it's just standard Kentucky. It's what you expect. <laughs> and you probably like that heat, don't you? Well, I've gotten used to it. When I when I first got here, like the first two weeks after I was ordained, it was unseasonably cool. Like we had the windows open and my members kept telling me, just wait, just wait, just wait. And the, and I was like, this is, you know, this isn't bad at all. This is great. And then all of a sudden <laughs> it was a hundred with a hundred percent humidity, like every day until uh, October. And at that point I realized I'm, I just have to resign myself to this, you know, as God <laughs> wills, so be it ever. <laughs> You you just submitted yourself to the hand of providence and that's just right. That's right. took your cross. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, we had a, a very large rainstorm last night, which was nice. And everything's just kind of humid and damp and wet today, which is always a blessing out here in the semi-arid part of North Dakota. So we, we never we never curse the rain when it comes. It's always a blessing of God. And otherwise, things are going pretty well out here. So, all right. Well, let's jump into our subject for today, talking about Leah and dealing with homiletics and being apt to teach. So now, maybe as a way of starting out this section then, David, can you kind of explain where we are in the book and kind of what Leah is doing yeah, here I, in the in this part? Sure. I think it's worth, I think it's worth doing that because... Just the way that we're doing the podcast here, you don't get the progression from chapter to chapter. But this is the first chapter in his second part. And the first part of the book that we've been through now really focuses on the man himself, right? His character, his marriage, what else? His training leading up to being in the ministry. And now Leah's going to kind of, he's not really changing topics, but he's going on to the actual work of the ministry. And so the very first thing he's going to talk about, this makes sense, right, is the primary task, the primary work for the pastor, which is the title of this chapter is homiletics. Why does Leah consider preaching to be the primary function of the office? Well, because the the sole means that the pastor has to carry out his, his task, which is to save the congregation. Humanly speaking, of course, it's the work of the Spirit to do that. But the means that we have to do this is the Word of God. And so how do you communicate the Word of God? It's by preaching and teaching. And so the to start off with that is, I mean, I think it's, it's a well-known thing for us, right? This isn't new ground or a fresh insight, but it's always good to, to come back to keep the main thing the main thing, don't you think? Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. If we have been called to be stewards of the word, we should be stewards of the word. I mean, we don't want to get distracted by other tasks. We don't want to get distracted by other conceptions of what the ministry is. We have been sent to do one thing, and that is to proclaim the living word of God. Yeah. But what would what would you say to someone who would ask, well, don't we, aren't we also stewards of the mysteries? Don't we also have the sacraments, how does that fit in with this conception of preaching being the chief means of grace? I know Leah even mentions this. He says, you know, certainly the pastor is also there to administer the sacraments. And there's lots of other things 
and we'll get into this in a minute, that a pastor does, right? It's not like he, you're just always preaching, always teaching. But specifically with this question about the sacraments, the sacraments derive their power from the word of God connected to them, right? So think of the catechism, how can water do such great things? How can eating and drinking do such great things? It's because this water has been brought into Christ's command to baptize. It's because the bread and the wine are what he took and said, take and eat, take and drink my body, my blood here. It's only because of those, because those visible elements are connected to the word of God that they have any power. And really, I mean, you can think of this too, just kind of in a practical way. If, if people are never taught about the sacraments, right? If you're doing a baptism on Sunday morning, but you've never instructed the parents about what baptism is, if you're celebrating the Lord's Supper every week, but there's no instruction going on about what this is, people have to be taught what these things are. Otherwise, it's just something that people are experiencing and you're hoping somehow that they're going <laughs> to, you know, get the point, you know. So the <laughs> preaching and teaching always go along with the sacraments. And really, if you didn't have the, the preaching and teaching along with them, you know, who knows what kind of misconceptions people would would come up with about these things. Nailing hosts, adores, and all that. Yeah, sort well, of stuff. right. I mean, you can look through church history and see when <laughs> when people are left to their own devices, they'll come up with with all kinds of I don't know what the right word is, bizarre, or all kinds of misconceptions. That's putting it kindly. Superstitions. <laughs> maybe that's the best way to put it. Yeah. No. I mean, even even with baptism and kind of the even the the superstitions that sometimes pe- modern people can sometimes put around baptism and what it can oh, yeah. and can't do. Yeah. You know, I, it's it really is a, a call for us to continually be preaching and teaching so that the sacraments can be administered correctly, which is not possible, of course, apart from the word. Yeah. So the even that phrase, right, the steward of steward of the mysteries, that's first Corinthians four. When Paul talks about mysteries, I think we we have talked about this as being the sacraments. Right. But I don't think mm-hmm. Paul is saying specifically the sacraments, right? He's talking about the mysteries of those things that God has revealed. Because in another place, sure. in another place, he says, right, great indeed is the mystery of our of godliness, right? And then he talks about right. the incarnation, the work of Christ. And so the mysteries, biblically speaking, is a broader category than just sacraments, right? That's a that's a one part of the mysteries, but it's not the entire mysteries. Yeah, no, that's that's an excellent point, because these things which have been hidden from before the foundation of the world and now revealed in these last days, of course, would be the revelation of Christ yeah, himself, yeah. which is not exclusive, like you say, to to the sacraments. So, well, if if we're going to continue on, then, I mean, with this idea of preaching being the chief means of grace, how does Leah talk about the the other parts of the, the work of the pastor, because you said kind of that it all kind of fits together, right? It all works together and is driving towards this end of proclamation. So yeah. how do, I mean, how does his life fit into this? How does his personal qualifications fit into this? I mean, how does that all work together, sure. according to Leah? Sure. It's a good, it's a good question. And if, if you've been listening to our episodes on this, or even I think Leah and Gerberding are pretty close. We did a whole series on Gerberding's pastoral theology too. And I mean, they're very specific about how the pastor is to live his life, right? And so they're very concerned about his example and his conduct in the office, right? And so if if you have an overly, you can, you can go off the track in two ways, right? You could either say, look, your example doesn't matter. All that matters is what you teach, right? Or you could say your example, just lead by example and people figure it out. Right. And so what Leah does nicely is he keeps both things full force. Right. So what he says here, he's going to get into this and say, you know, what about a man's experience? What about his wisdom? What about his eagerness? What about his the outward conditions around him? Don't those things contribute to his the work of the office? And he says they do, but they do in not in and of themselves. Right. So take the example of your life, the pastor's life that can either open up avenues to teach, or it can, he'll talk about removing obstacles to the pastor's teaching. 
the pastor's work in charitable organizations can open up avenues for him to then actually speak and teach, or it can remove obstacles that might come up and prevent people from hearing the teaching. But again, in all of those things, the example, the conduct, the other parts of his ministry, they don't exist in a vacuum. They're there to help him teach or remove obstacles. So just think of this example. We talk about this sometimes, right? When you go to the hospital for for someone who's sick or or even at funerals, it's not always that you're that you're saying you're not just constantly speaking, right? So sometimes we'll talk about a ministry of presence. Right? Well, <laughs> you do have to end up opening your mouth at some point, right? But right. just if you weren't there, if you you know, you might only teach for, or you might only preach for 5 10 minutes and you might be with a family for an hour, 2 hours just waiting for test results or being at the hospital with them. Does that mean that that time was wasted? Certainly not, right? You were opening up the opportunity, you were removing an obstacle so that they could hear you when the time was right. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it it really does. And I know in my own experience as as limited as it has been, even even just when the family knows that you are willing and able to come and be with them in a given situation can mean a great deal. I mean, yeah. the when you know having to to drive a tremendous distance in order to be at the bedside of someone who's dying is going to mean a great deal to the family. We just don't want to make that into the whole work of the ministry as, you know, your your willingness to to drive great distances or something, but we cannot discount that as as a good aid towards the proclamation of the message. Yeah. Cause if, if they don't know that you care, <laughs> they're right. not going to care. You know, I know it, it sounds like a cliche, but it really is true. Yeah. It's godliness is also next to cleanliness. It's that's one of those kind of sayings, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can't really disagree with it, but at the same time, you can't make it into the, the yeah. totality. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, now, If we are dealing with these other aspects contributing to the proclamation of the word and the importance of these things all working together, the scriptures speak about being apt to teach. I mean, obviously, this comes from Paul and the qualifications for the ministry. What does Paul mean by that? And does Leah set it out in in kind of the same way? Yeah, he that's really what this chapter, at least the first part of the chapter is all about. What does it mean to be apt to teach? Where does that gift come from? And how can that gift be developed by a man? So what he's going to say is that the aptness to teach is a is something that's given by God, but it's a he calls it a natural gift, as opposed, or not maybe not opposed, but differentiated from a spiritual gift. So this is something that is given to us similar to the way that we say in the in the meaning of the first article right he's given me my eyes ears my reason and all my senses the ability to teach comes from the creator and uh, and is a gift in that way but it's a gift that can be nurtured it's a gift that can be sanctified and must be sanctified by the spirit so that it also becomes more than just a natural gift does that answer your question it does. I mean, and it also kind of prompts this question then, too. Why would Leah and perhaps Paul emphasize that this being apt to teach is, in fact, a gift of God? Why is that an important distinction to make as opposed to saying that you don't need to be apt to teach or that it's only kind of a minor qualification? Yeah, I think part of it would be to say that that not everyone has it, right? Right. Or men can have it in different to different degrees it it's it's not quite the same thing as just be having a high iq or something because you right. could have the highest iq and still not be an apt teacher right <laughs> the, the the proverbial ivory tower academic yeah, yeah. With, you know completely out of touch with everything yeah. yeah or you could you could be very he distinguishes it also from eloquence right we're not just talking about being a good speaker or or having um uh oh, i'm stumbling over my words now so this is good i guess um it's not that you always <laughs> just have the right words to speak but you know the subject 
and you can actually communicate it in a way that that people understand you. So why that's important is because if you don't have that, <laughs> if you are not able to teach others, then you really can't carry out the ministry, right? Right. And I, I remember we talked about this a little bit with Gerberding, too, when the the gift of being apt to teach and the gift of eloquence are two different things so that one could be a terrible speaker in theory, but, you know, quite apt in actually being able to teach what it is that needs to be taught. I mean, you think of the old preachers who just straight read their sermons, like nose to the manuscript, kind of just going line by line, not really inflecting or anything. That can be a benefit to God's people because it is still presenting God's word faithfully. So being apt to teach is not the same as eloquence, like you say, but that doesn't mean that eloquence is there, therefore bad right. or therefore necessarily, you know, a bad, you know, a, a thing that we don't want. We do want to present it well, but the two are not one yeah. and the same thing. Yeah. One is necessary and the other one is beneficial, right? So right. being apt to teach, you have to have that, but eloquence it's not necessary in the same way, right? It's, it's helpful so that people do listen and, and enjoy the teaching, but it's not necessary in the same way. Yeah. Can eloquence be a distraction to preaching? I think it can be if it's contrived. What do you mean by that? Well, what I mean is if you're, if um, this would never happen, of course, right, Zelwyn? But if you, <laughs> of course, if you, would, if you have <laughs> such a, such a contrived, what do we call it? Uh, chancel tone, right? So in <laughs> your but wine, yeah, yeah, yeah. Suddenly, when you preach, you just sound like a completely different person, and people are sitting there, and they, you know, they've listened to you all week long. They've talked with you before the service, and you spoke like a normal person. Then all of a sudden, you know, all your pronunciations change, and you're using these highfalutin words. <laughs> people <laughs> people are going to that's going to become an obstacle and a hurdle now maybe it can be overcome but it's probably an unnecessary hurdle and he even he talks about this later on he talks about elocution and he really says you know it's it's not it's a good thing to sound like yourself right now certainly right. the pastor wants to wants to be the best speaker he can be and there's a place for rhetoric and for eloquence that's not they're not bad like we said a minute ago but if that becomes the goal then something has gone wrong and, and Leah, i think he's he's kind of taking some shots at the north he even mentions you know the just listen to some of the sermons that are coming out of north america he says and he he's <laughs> i think he's he he may be speaking about Walther and the Missourians, but he says they try so hard to sound like Luther that they they don't sound like themselves anymore. Right. Well, and and imitation can be a a good thing because it can teach us the the mechanics of how to actually go about doing something. But if you're always imitating and never actually finding your own rhetorical style, your own voice, so to speak, yeah. that that can be quite quite a problem because. The, the way Luther speaks is certainly appropriate for his own time and day, and there's much that we can glean from him, but we don't speak that way anymore. Yeah. And the fact that it has to be translated already puts another hurdle in between a clear understanding and what it is that that, that needs to be proclaimed in, yeah. in the word. Yeah, just think of there's a difference between imitation and aping someone, just even in the right. connotation of those words. If you're aping, you know, Jacobian language— that might not, you're, you're probably not really imitating Luther's preaching so much as you are just sort of peeling off the veneer, you know, and, and people, this is, here's the point that comes off as hollow, right? People right. hear it and they, I think that they, they sense, well, here's a buzzword for our times. They sense an inauth, inauthenticity to it. And maybe if I use that word, I'm unauthentic myself, but <laughs> don't you don't you agree Zellan? I mean I think people are so there's so much noise around us and so much right. I think part of this is just the the advertising and the everybody's always listening to something that people are very aware of when a message is not is ringing hollow and when it's also then when it's coming and ringing true too. Sure. 
Well, and I know, and just kind of as a closing thought for this section, then I know in Leia's day there was a common complaint complaint across the board that preaching had become hollow because preachers wanted to appear to appear extremely educated in their preaching. And so by peppering their their sermons with Greek and Latin and, you know, all kinds of quotations and, you know, trying to structure it, you know, just perfectly, it was not meeting the spiritual needs of the people. And as a result of that, there is a continued emphasis in Leah's day and down to our own, and rightly so, of speaking in such a way that is going to actually resonate and educate rather than just make it appear like you're somebody important. Yeah. So, all right, with that, we're going to go into our first break. We'll be right back with more Word Fitly Spoken. The word of the Lord says, Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. You can check out all of the Word Fitly Spoken podcasts on Podbean, iTunes, or your favorite podcast app. We'll be right back. And we are back. Zelwyn Heidi, David Appold, talking about Leia on homiletics. So we left in the last section talking about being apt to teach and what that looks like. But Leia, interestingly, does not see a sharp division between the different kinds of teaching. Like he sees homiletics as being more than what is done in the pulpit. Is that right, David? Right. So he'll talk about various forms of teaching. And under that broad category of teaching, he'll, he'll talk about, you know, there, is there really a difference between like a continuous lecture series versus a dialogue that you might have with a person? Well, it's a different form, but the intention is the same, which is to teach God's word, right? So if you've got this, and maybe this is a little bit it expands, I think, the chapter from being just about preaching a sermon, which is sort of what I expected. You know, when you see homiletics, when you hear that word homiletics, I think if you're like me, you automatically think, okay, the Sunday preaching service or, you know, Wednesday evening for us, Advent or a Lenten service. Sure. But he, he kind of says, look, don't confine this idea to, to an overly narrow thing, right? Where it's just, we're only doing quote unquote homiletics in the pulpit. You're doing this in various forms at different times in your ministry. And so just like you would, the, what he's going to say about homiletics applies certainly to the sermon, but it also could be applied to the way that we teach our Bible classes, or uh, even just in the conversation you have with your confirmation classes, maybe even when you're talking with new members one-on-one, when you're just talking to someone who comes to you for counsel, all of that, you're trying to apply God's word to them. And so you're trying to teach. Sure. So you'd say that uh, God instituted homiletics, then it just takes multiple forms? Sure. (laughs) (laughs) It's sort of like preach the word in season and out of season. You can apply that in to, to, to different situations. Paul wasn't just saying to Timothy, preach sermons on Sunday mornings. Yeah, exactly. Well, why do we, in our context, tend to divide them up so distinctly? Like we make such a, we make such divisions between what is done in the pulpit, for example, and the kind of assumptions that we have about what is done in the pulpit and what is done, say, at Bible class. You know, why, why do we make such divisions between them? It would probably come from 
there'd be a, a, a healthy sense that what's happening in the Sunday service, in the divine service, is of a different character than what's happening in Bible class. Now, if you if you stretch that too far, you you know you're trying to elevate the sermon to be preaching God's word, mm-hmm. and so you want to take that seriously, right? You don't want to just get up in the pulpit and say the first five things that come into your mind. You want to actually have thought through your intentions. You want to have a good structure, and you want to speak well, and and you want to say what you really want to say, and not just be carried along by what flies into your mind. But the the issue, I think, and we talk about this quite a bit, maybe not always on the podcast, but if you have such a division between Bible class and teaching the Bible and preaching a sermon, because you're trying to elevate the sermon, you downplay the teaching of the Bible. And so Sunday morning Bible class, is that I mean, are you just firing off at the hip there or, or aren't you, aren't you doing the same thing just in a different context where there's, there's opportunities for people to ask questions and, you know, maybe you are going out into the weeds a little bit more with particular historical things that you wouldn't bring into a sermon, but they're, they're really not all, they're not hugely different things. Although we, I think we would say that they, that there is a, a distinction to be made. Well, I mean, they have different rhetorical devices that we use. They have a different general structure. But I think what Leia is getting at is that their ultimate aim is the same. And so if they're kind of, there are two things that are heading towards the same destination, and therefore they fall under the same category. Whereas if we treat them as being two completely separate and distinct things with two different aims, then we end yeah. up treating one in, in one way and in, uh, one in the other in the other way, which can be actually a, a detriment to our, our ministry. And, that, and that's what he, he says here. The intention is to teach God's word. And that, can, that happens whether you're preaching or in a dialogue or, or just in, for us, Sunday morning Bible class. Um, but he, he is often bringing up the passage, all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof for correction and for training in righteousness. And so he kind of says, look, this is the these are the biblical categories. And so anytime you're doing one of these things, you are doing homiletics and and intentionally so. Maybe it's not as formal in one at one time as it is at another time, but that doesn't mean that it's not the same thing. Well, what other things fall under this category then? Does does catechetics fall under this this category of homiletics? I think so. He's he does have a separate section on catechetics. And I think that's the next the next chapter actually. So so even though he kind of groups them together as different forms of teaching, he's also he's not saying that they're identical and that they have the same purposes in mind. But what but what he's saying is, look, teaching is just imparting information, right? The the homiletical aspect comes in when that information is the knowledge of salvation, and you're applying it to a person, that's when you're, you're going beyond just kind of, I'm going to teach you the history of, you know, the city of Galilee or something like that. That really is not homiletics. That's just historical teaching. But when you're actually applying God's word, you want it to grip a person's heart for what they believe and how they live. That's where you get into the realm of homiletics. And so catechetics you're certainly teaching the doctrines of the church. Here's what the Bible teaches. Here's what the church teaches. Here's what we believe. But you're also saying, and it here's how it makes a difference in the way that you live. So you're saying I shouldn't vest for catechetics during catechism <laughs> class? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, so, so Leia even appreciates the difference between them so that he will spend quite a bit more time on catechetics, like you said. Yeah. But, but it's important to, to see how they work together. But what about liturgics? How does, how does that fit into yeah, this? Yeah, he, he brings up a, a really, again, I wasn't expecting this, this, this whole chapter, I was kind of expecting him, you know, like I said before, the, t- the heading is homiletics. And so you expect something similar to maybe law and gospel, Walter's law and gospel, but you don't really get anything <laughs> even remotely <laughs> close to that. It's kind of amazing. He brings up the question of whether liturgics and what happens in the liturgy is teaching. And he says, it is, but not 
not intentionally. It's it's mm. unintentionally teaching. And he kind of goes into a little, here's just kind of his view on it. And we can talk about whether we, we agree or disagree in a minute. He says, what's often said is that the liturgy teaches. And he says that's true, but but he kind of brings that out of the history of the Reformation. At the time of the Reformation, he says things had devolved so far and people knew so little that the Lutherans, especially Luther, when he makes his liturgical changes, he, he's very concerned about pure doctrine, pure doctrine, pure doctrine. So the hymns, the liturgy, the prayers, there's always this focus on, is it teaching true doctrine? What Leah says is that that was a concern that was valid, but it's really not the the role of the of the liturgical service to teach. Okay, unintentionally, of course, the liturgy teaches, but that's not its primary purpose. Its primary purpose is to pray, right? To praise and thank God as the corporate worship of the church. And so he he actually says this is really not in the realm of homiletics. Hmm. Well, I know that very often in our own day, we tend to go the other route, the one that he was talking about with the Reformation, and say that we preserve the liturgy, or at least this is the argument that I've heard the most often, precisely because it teaches. Yeah. You know, that it teaches us to, we know, what in the God's gifts, it teaches us about, you know, what God is doing. And we even kind of justify things like the lectionary on the basis of a kind of a catechetical teaching kind of approach, right? Sure. At least I do. I don't know about sure. you. <laughs> I don't think that he's that he's saying that that's necessarily like like that's that's not wrong, right? And it's sure. not wrong to say he'll say liturgics does have a teaching function. All he's saying, and I think he's right, is that it's not the primary function. And so, if your only concern is, am I giving the people prayers and hymns that teach them, that instruct them, you're you're sort of missing the boat about what the role of worship is. Yes, people need to be taught. And I mean, that's really the primary time we have to connect with a lot of our members is just in that hour service on Sunday morning. So it needs to have meat and be substantive. I'm not saying anything against that. But I I, I think he's right to say that the liturgy and the worship of the church, maybe broaden it out from just the liturgy, has a different function. It has a different intention than preaching and teaching. And that, that intention is for, for people to worship God to in the kind of the, the base sense of that word, right? Just to offer their praise and thanksgiving to God. And so it doesn't need to always be the most robust, send your letters, yes, right here, right? But it doesn't always <laughs> need to be the most robust catechetical hymn for the hymn of the day. Sure, I, sure. Maybe I'm over-exaggerating the point, but I just don't see, like, if you're going to sing Beautiful Savior, like, you don't have to feel guilty about that. Um, sometimes people <laughs> need to just praise God. Yeah, it's okay to let them sing the hymns that they like on occasion. I mean, what, yeah, if people if people enjoy, like, singing to God, it, have we done something wrong? <laughs> <laughs> Delight in worship, is that a bad thing? I, I think it's an interesting it's an interesting point because you know when the scriptures talk about sacrifice in the New Testament, of course they're talking about you know prayer, praise, and thanksgiving, kind of the the corollary between the the old grain offerings of the Old Testament and the salt that was offered with them. So I think it is an important thing to remember that when we do come before the living God, we are presenting before Him sacrifices. It's just those sacrifices are not the bloody sacrifices of Christ, but the sacrifices of prayer and praise and thanksgiving. And when we do that, when we bring forth those New Testament sacrifices, we are doing what God has, well, commanded us to do. So I can see, I can see Leah's point. I mean, that what we are doing in worship is being taught, yes, but it is ultimately bringing I mean, and of course, you know, we talk about this in so many different ways, but there, we cannot discount the, the New Testament sacrificial aspect of what is happening in the divine service. Yeah. Let me, I'll just read a quote. The ignorant and the children who take part in the churchly life of the congregation certainly will learn much, but in an, but in an unintentional manner, just like one learns from everything in life. 
But it is a different thing if one asks whether liturgy can also teach, among other things, or if one asks whether the intention of the church is to teach with the liturgy. So see, that's where he's getting this. Yes, sure, it does teach, but it's un, it's that's not the primary intention. Well, and I, I think his, his mentioning children is also an important one because, you know, how often do you hear that argument that we preserve the historic liturgy because, you know, it teaches those who can't read, for example, you know, most yeah. often being young children. Yeah. And, I, and I'll be the first one to admit that, you know, there is a great delight in seeing my own children, you know, understanding what is going on on Sunday morning, that it's, they're, they're familiar with it, they understand the structure of it. And that can help benefit that can be a benefit to them. But at the same time, you know, being familiar with something and having that familiarity is a far different thing from, say, actually, you know, learning something, you know, it being just the, the primary purpose of what's happening. It's not just to make us and this kind of a hu- habitual, this is just what we do. And so it's so we can remember it later in life. It is to offer to God our prayer, praise, and thanksgiving, and to receive his gifts at the same time. So yeah, there is something different going on, wouldn't you say? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Well, we've kind of hammered that point, and we'll probably get all kinds of letters now for that one. But if we're going to be talking about the being apt to teach and the ability to teach, is that something then that is purely, I mean, just you, you have it or you don't, or is that something that can actually be improved and, you know, increased? And can we learn how to teach, yes, so to speak? Right. And I think I think we'd have to we'd have to answer, of course, right? Not everyone is given the the ability to teach, but those who are given the ability are probably more than actually become pastors. So this is again, this is a created gift. It's a gift of creation. It's not a, a gift of the spirit. But it's it is also then developed by it's it's refined. I don't know exactly what the right word for this is, but but you can grow in your ability to teach. And so he has a couple of sections here where he he talks about how it is that a person is trained to be a good teacher. And it's he, he it's not you know you don't go off into the desert and pray God make me a good teacher. And then suddenly, you know, the heavens open and it's imparted that way. He says, you go to school, basically, and you learn to do this at school. But he he especially stresses dialectics. These are his words and rhetoric, the study of dialectics and rhetoric. So he doesn't want us to turn into St. Anthony. Is that what you're telling me? Correct. (laughs) Don't go live on top of a pedestal. It won't do you much good. (laughs) Being a stylite is not going to make you a better teacher. But... Yeah, no, I I think that's an excellent point that I think even in our own experiences, as you know, the further along we go in the ministry, I think we will find ourselves improving even at, say, just giving a sermon. Like I can remember like my earliest sermons that I given, and I'm not saying that I'm by any means an expert, and I certainly have much room to grow, but I can remember those earlier ones being not so great. I mean, I don't know how else to put it. Sure. Like think think back to your homiletics classes in seminary, David. Can you remember any of those sermons that that you wrote for those classes? <laughs> I can remember them. I can remember thinking that they were really good, and then I think every once right. in a while I'll stumble across them, like on my hard drive somewhere, and I, I'm just I open them up, and it's it's almost embarrassing. I can't even get past like the second paragraph. It's just just close it down, <laughs> you know, shut it down. I shut it down. This no no more of this. Yeah. The sins of my youth. No, I'm kidding. But here's Leia's point, and it's a good one. This is the natural way that a a God-given gift is refined is it actually, it doesn't happen kind of mystically, shall we say. It happens through very ordinary things. So he, he brings out, he recommends Melanchthon's works on logic and rhetoric. And some of, some of our listeners may be picking up on this is very much the classical education model that he's that Leia probably is just assuming that everyone's going through, right? Sure. So you have grammar, you have logic, you have rhetoric. And for the the ability to teach, it's especially logic or dialectics and rhetoric that are important. You have to be able to distinguish what things are connected from those things that aren't connected. 
And then you have to be able to communicate that in a way that is gripping, that's actually coherent, and that people can receive and pick up on. And that can be developed by a person. And actually, this is, this is what's so amazing about this chapter, is that he spends the rest of the time talking about the form of the sermon, and he really doesn't mention much about the content. <laughs> the content will just kind yeah, of be there. Yeah, he's very much interested in the structure. And he's, you know, I think the, it's not that he didn't care about the content, certainly, but the structure, if, if you have, if you're paying attention to structure, that's what you're doing is you're kind of, you're thinking about the rhetoric of the sermon and the dialectical progression from thought to thought to thought. Well, and if, if our listeners remember back in a, in previous episodes too, and this is something, of course, a, a common meme on word fitly anyway, being in the word constantly and kind of having a, a constant exposure to the to the word, including that cursory kind of reading that Leia recommends so highly, you're basically going to get the grammar portion of the classical educational model just through that kind of reading. You're kind sure. of getting the building blocks for the sermon. And so he doesn't really need to think about the content of what's going on because the content's in, in a sense already there. It's more of a question of now that you have these building blocks, you know, you have a, a bunch of Legos before you, what are you going to do with them? You can't just leave them in a, in a pile in the middle of the floor. You need to pick them up and do something with yeah. them. And I think, I, well, I think that this, if, if you are listening and you're a pastor and, you know, you want to improve on your ability to teach, this is, a, this is you certainly read the Bible right? We always say that, P pick up and read. <laughs> I think that's one of our, our commercials, right? It is, yeah. But attention to, to logic, attention to rhetoric, that's also going to benef be beneficial. And it's not something that should be seen as secondary or, you know, kind of unnecessary. It's, it's part and parcel of this whole business of being apt to teach and being good at it. And speaking of commercials, we need to go into our our second break. So we'll be right back with more Word Fitly Spoken. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. The Word, front and center, in doctrine, in history, in life. That's the mission of A Word Fitly Spoken. We've got more on the way. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. And we are back. Zelwyn, Heidi, David Apple talking about Leia, homiletics, and being apt to teach. So in the previous sections, we just got done talking about things like what it means to be apt to teach, the things like how one improves in his ability to teach, even though it is something that is given by God. And so I thought in this last section, it might be worthwhile to talk about what or how Leia actually structures a sermon and the kind of advice that he gives for progressing in your ministry and how you want to go about that and how he actually views the task of preaching itself, kind of more narrowly defined. So, David, why don't we start with his kind of advice for how to progress in one's homiletical ability, kind of from year to year? What does that look like? Sure. Yeah, he, he actually offers, I think, some sound advice, it's nothing, it, it's probably stuff that if you're a pastor, you've heard at some point. If not, it's worth, I think it's worth kind of pondering. He says, and this is really picking up on something that he had said previously in the book when he talked about when you first get started in the office, you know, don't try to do everything all at once. Do what is in front of you, do what's necessary, and kind of, you want to build, 
as you go, as you work in your ministry, which is, you know, that's, that's just good advice about anything, right? Sure. So, so the way it comes to preaching, he says, works like this. Your first year through, and he's operating with the idea of a one-year lectionary. So you're going to come back to this stuff every year. Your first year through, he says, just try to preach very, I don't want to say basic, but textual homilies. Okay. And so he, he has this idea that you're, you really just want the, the congregation to kind of steep in the text itself. And your, your job, your first year, it, you want to view it as just explaining the details of the text. You're not really trying to go into too much application. You just want everybody to, you're, you're laying a foundation. Okay. Sure. Then in the second year, you're, tr- you, you try to build on that. So if, if you're thinking in the classical model, you go from the grammar to the logic, and here you're giving the main thought. So you're you're moving a little bit deeper into the application of the texts. Then he's he in the third year he says now you you want to start systematizing things, right? So you you want to put these texts into their what we would call their lotzi, right? So you want to say this has to do with the humiliation of Christ, or this has to do with I don't know, some other dogmatic category or an ethical one. He brings that out too. And then he's got this great quote. He says, after this, you'll never run out of ideas. You'll be so, <laughs> you'll have so much to talk about. You'll never run out of any ideas. <laughs> now, is is this advice that he's giving primarily to a new pastor or is this something that any pastor could apply? Well, the I think you could apply this at any point if you want to renew your preaching, I suppose. But really it's for when you come to a new congregation. So one of the underlying assumptions here is before you can really start to apply the texts, you you have to know the situation that you're speaking to, right? The, the congregation as right. a whole, uh, individual people's lives. And you just really, there's no way to do that except through being in a place for a while. So again, it's it's not earth shattering insight, but it's just kind of basic understanding of who the congregation is, who you are, how you're going to be, how you're going to relate to them in the first couple of years. It's going to, you're not really going to have the full picture. And so before you start launching into, you know, we're going to, you know, apply all of this text in all of its dimensions, it would be good if, if you really knew the situation first. <laughs> Instead of just running in blindly and and yeah. making you know cross the board declarations, right. I know about <laughs> you people, and here's your problem. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell what the problem I have with all of y'all. Yeah. Well, very good. Well, so with that in mind, then how does Leia actually structure a sermon? Like, how does he lay it out in terms of its actual form? Because, sure. like, as we mentioned in the previous section, he's not so much interested in the content at this point, because that's kind of the, the grammar stage, the earlier stuff that comes from the cursory reading, but he's interested in how one actually structures it. Yeah. So what does that look like? Well, 10 minutes of fierce law and 10 minutes in one <laughs> second of comforting gospel. <laughs> uh, Boom. Yeah, yeah. Done. He, this, is what, this is what's amazing about the chapter, or surprising anyways, is that he, he doesn't talk about the content of the sermon much at all. And so he, when he's talking about the huh. structure, he, he says the Christian speech or sermon, and again, remember, he's, he's applying this not just to the sermon, but he has this broader category of homiletics, right? He says, you know, it's going to follow the, the basic structure of any speech. And so here you can, you can pick up that he's, he's applying what he had talked about previously under his, where he talks about learn, the pastor should learn rhetoric so that he can compose his speech well. And so he talks about kind of the, I think this is the classical model of a speech, has all these different parts. And he says the sermon will naturally have these parts. And so you you have a preamble, you have your narration, you have the proposition, the confirmation of that proposition, the confutation. I don't know if our if you wanted all these details. And then at the very end, you have your <laughs> Latin term is peroration or peroratio, which is kind of the emotional appeal at the at the, right. at the end of the sermon. The stinger at the end. Yeah. 
to put in maybe a little bit more jargon, less jargony kind of thing. Now, is this something that you find to be true of all sermons, or is this something that is this maybe a more formal approach that than we might be used to? I mean, this this to use these kind of terms and like say, okay, now I'm entering into the preamble of my sermon is not at least in my mind, is not how I usually go about it. Yeah. I mean, is this is this instinctual or is this just kind of a more formal way of doing things than maybe we do in our own situation? What do you think? I think it's a product of of his education, right? I think if if you were trained sure. kind of to think about giving a speech in rhetorical, kind of the classical rhetorical model, I think it would be more natural. But I didn't go through that. I don't, I don't know about you, Zelwyn, but, you know, we think in terms of like, okay, I need to have an introduction and then like exegesis and then right. application. Right. Sure. I mean, that's kind of sure. the general thing. And then, you know, you, you look back and you say, okay, personally, I look back and I, I don't think through as I'm composing my sermon, I'm not thinking about too much about law and gospel. But when I look back, I do use that as an an analysis, a way to evaluate, did I, am I preaching the law? Am I preaching the gospel? Right. So I, I do use those categories, but yeah, I don't really think too much about the structure and that may be to my own detriment. I don't know. Well, um, I think when it comes to our own structuring, I know like in my own experience with preaching, we do tend to break down our sermons into distinct sections, like you say. And so I think some of this is a little bit instinctual, especially if you're communicating effectively. I mean, you're going to be communicating a clear point yeah. and you're going to be trying to support that point or however many points you have in a sermon. So I think what he's doing with this kind of formal rhetorical structure that he's talking about is really just kind of laying out in academic terms what preaching is going to do if it's going to be effective anyway. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And he, and he'll even say in here, the narration, he says, that's where you're really doing the majority of your work in preaching, especially because that's where you're, you're real exegetical, you know, I'm going to explain the text, I'm going to explain the details here, the geographical matters, the grammatical stuff that happens for him in the narration. And then you sum it up with the proposition. And then you either have to confirm that or refute errors that confusions that people might have about that. It does, You're right. It does. When I think about my sermons now, I think it does. You kind of naturally fall into this stuff without trying to. And so to be aware of it would actually be helpful, right? Magnets. How do they yeah. work? <laughs> they just exert invisible forces on us, right? <laughs> Just like pause attraction, to quote Joe Dirt, it just does. But these these things, I think, are somewhat instinctual, especially as you get more experience with preaching, as you begin to learn how to communicate effectively, and you strive to do these things better. Alea is just doing it, like you say, in a more academic kind of way. So, But what other kind of aspects do we have to preaching? I mean, what else is there? that kind of contributes to the preaching task? Because it's not just the actual structure of the sermon, but there's kind of all the other additional things too. And what would those be? He has, and some of this I think is, again, because he's not trying to do the the law and gospel kind of thesis, I'm going to give you a bunch of theses and then back them up. He, he actually spends a little more time on some of the other matters that people often talk about with preaching. You know, how long should the sermon be? Should you be extemporaneous in your sermons or should you be reading? I don't think he talks about a manuscript, but how much preparation should you do in advance? He'll even talk about elocution, which we've talked a little bit about already. Pronunciation. He's got a section in here about <laughs> gesticulation. You know, how high is it okay to wave your arms above your head? <laughs> he said no. <laughs> He's too German for that. But yeah, but but. To be honest, like those are the things, those are things that people do talk about and notice in preaching, right? So sure. it's, it's, people are not only interested in the content and there's other aspects of preaching that do leave an impression with people and can either help or hinder your preaching, your teaching. I know when I was a kid, 
my dad, this might just be from being a, a preacher's kid, but we would always give him a hard time about his hand, the way that he moved his hands and, you know, making air quotes or something. We would always kind of point that out to him. And now that I'm preaching, I always feel like hyper. I feel like, um, what's the movie? Where, where do I put my hands? Um, you know, like <laughs> I'm nervous that everyone is just watching my hands. <laughs> It has come back to haunt you. Yeah. 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 Well, inter- what is, what does Leah say about the actual length of the sermon? Cause I think yeah. that is something that is kind of continues to be a hot topic for everyone. Cause you know, the, the clergy want to go on forever, but the lady want it to be as short as possible. I think it's kind of the, the, the meme for that, you know? Right. What is the ideal length? He says, and he, he even attributes this to Luther, although there's no citation of this. He says the general rule should be around half an hour. Now that, I think that would be long for our times, don't you think? Uh, right. If you were yeah. going to go half an hour. But he says half an hour. He's got some He's got some interesting kind of proverbs that he says. He says the general rule ought to be what I have to speak, I say. And when I am done, I sit down. <laughs> so... But he'll also That's pretty solid advice, fam. Yeah, yeah. He'll also say, and I remember this from Juan Gospel from Walther too. So it must have been in the air at that point. Was you always want? It's better to have a shorter sermon where people want to hear more than to go too long and have them leave saying, "I wish he would have preached less." Right. Right. Yeah. That. So that's his. He he says it's it's relative and it's subjective. And it's also it's also connected to to the gift and the ability of the preacher. A long sermon can feel short if it's delivered well and if it's if it's applicable well. And in the same way, a, a very short sermon can feel like it's going on forever if it's if it's composed poorly and delivered <laughs> poorly, right? Right. Yeah, and I I know from personal experience sometimes you just deliver a clunker of a sermon right. and that's just kind of how it goes. But you just kind of got to pick up and and try try it again next week. So, so maybe with the last few minutes that we have in this segment and in this episode, David, since you're basically the only one of us of the regulars on Word Fitly who actually has one of his sermons as part of the Word Fitly Spoken episodes, <laughs> how do you actually go about? Yes, I've become the gold standard here. You are the standard. Do you mean, do you want to know like structuring the sermon or study or just general, generally speaking? I'm just, how do you, how do you, let's say it's, it's Monday morning or maybe Mm -hmm. uh, Sunday afternoon. You've, you're done with your services and you're looking forward to next week. I don't know what day you start your preparation, but what is, what does your preparation look like? I usually, I start on Monday morning. I mean, I know in advance, we follow the one year lectionary here. So I know generally maybe not so much in the Trinity time, but in the festival season, I know what the texts are going to be. But on Monday morning, I actually do read, I read Greek. I don't read Hebrew, but I read (laughs) Greek. And if I'm really interested, I'll look in the Septuagint. But for the most part, um, I focus on either the epistle or the gospel. And I do an an exegetical study, just like we would have, similar to what we would have done at, at the seminary. Not sure. You know, I'm not writing anything out, but word study, you're looking stuff up in a dictionary or a, a word book, parallel passages. And some of this stuff Leia doesn't say in his to do this, but he, he does speak about the pastor. If you don't study it for yourself, it's going to come out as hollow. We talked about this before. And so, right. so my initial kind of reading is just for my own sake what does this, I I just kind of go through the basic questions. Who's speaking to whom? What is the content? How would it be applied in my own life? And that usually is all I do on Monday. Then if it depends on how fast or slow the week is, you know that, Zelwyn. Right. When I come back to it, I, I want to have, I've been thinking about it and now I'm ready to to kind of do some sort of basic outline what do I think is the main thought in the text? What's the main thought that I want to deliver in the sermon? And then I usually 
if if it's a if I have a good amount of time in the week, I'll do this either on Thursday or Friday. Mm -hmm. I usually th this would be a Thursday morning kind of thing for me, where I actually then write out the sermon, like I type it up, and then finally the to actually preach the sermon on Sunday morning. I've I've gone back and forth on actually having the manuscript or not, and I I like to preach. I I would much rather preach without a manuscript, just for sure. my own. It's it's more, I don't know if this is the right thing to say, but it's more exciting <laughs> for me, you know. I'd, sure. And and I excitement is not the goal, so I'm I'm just trying to put it into the right words here. It you're you're more actively your mind is more actively engaged in what you're saying. And that sure. that's not that that can't be done with a manuscript. And I do preach from a manuscript, especially if it was a busy week and I didn't have much time to really, after I wrote it, to to try to, I don't memorize it, but to kind of have the basic outline in my head that I'm going to preach mm -hmm. from, then I'll I'll read it from the manuscript. But the times when I've been able to preach without the manuscript, I, fe I have felt like, this is, I would prefer to do this more frequently. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, and like with my own preparation, I mean, I would say it's very similar to yours. Maybe just kind of different days that I do these different things. I tend to preach just from outlines because I find that to be, like you say, the most, I don't know, the you, you really feel like you're really getting into what it is that you're proclaiming yeah. and you have to know your material well enough to right. be able to do it. And I, I just find it to be a a much when it when it works really well, you can deliver the sermon very, very well. But there, of course, there are days that I've, you know, kind of crashed and burned on a sermon, too. And that you just kind of pick up and move on. Yeah. And of course, those are usually the days people say, oh, that was such a great sermon. Pastor. <laughs> right. It's like, oh, OK, right. We have very different criteria than what the what the hearers do, don't we? Yeah, exactly. He, he talks about this in Leah does his section on whether you should be extemporaneous or do preparation. And he says, you know, it is a gift to be able to speak coherently, clearly, without, without having done a bunch of preparation. And he says gifts, because it is a gift, it can be stirred. You don't want to neglect it if, you're, if you can do that. But sure. I, I don't think he, if I remember right now, I didn't prepare too much on this section, but he does come out and say, look, as a pastor, you you just you don't want to leave it open to just spur of the moment, because right. the, what will happen you will lose you lose the trust of your hearers if you do that. Even if it's only a couple times where you kind of you know kind of utterly flail about, that that really does harm future future preaching. Does that make sense? It does. It does. And yeah, I'm and I'm not trying to give the impression that like that what you're doing or what I'm doing is completely just flailing about. I mean, obviously, we've done our work. That's more of like in the cases where you're just literally coming in with zero preparation right, right. and just going where the spirit leads you and to use the <laughs> the right, mystical right. terminology that I've only done that once. That happened to me one time. I was at a <laughs> funeral. The guy didn't show up. And so everybody's there uh Oh, and man, that was hard. It was hard to do. And I don't, looking back, I was like, well, should I do this or should I say no? And I felt like I had to do it. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. No, I, I don't know what I would have done, but man, that, that would be tough. Cause even, even when those situations where you're coming in with like less than maybe what you want, you've still at least thought through the whole thing right. to actually just do it cold with zero preparation. I, May, I hope I never have to, is all I'm saying. <laughs> well, any final thoughts then, David? Or I think I think just to kind of sum things up here, Leah's point in all of this is, go back to what we were saying at the very beginning, the, the pastor is there to lead his flock to the pastures of eternal life. And the means that we have are, is, there's only really one means, it's the word of God, taught, catechized, preached proclaimed through conversation, through counsel. And so to, to take time to think through even things that, that we might read and think, you know, I don't really need to think too much about 
these formal structures, it's going to be beneficial. It, it has to be. And to develop the gift of being able, apt to teach and to make it into, to refine it and to have that be a goal of ministry, I think is, is hugely important for us and something we always, no matter where you are, you can, you can be better at what you're doing on this category. Amen. This has been a Word Fitly Spoken. If you like what you heard, you can check us out at wordfitlyspoken.org, on Twitter at wordfitly, or facebook.com slash wordfitly. I am Zelwyn Heidi, here with David Appold. God love you, and God bless. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works.